hero to some, a monster to others. He hoped to start a third world war. Ante las exigencias del imperialismo. The CIA and American special forces conspired to bring him down. His death is shrouded in mystery, his body secretly buried in an unmarked grave. But the man they hoped the world would forget is the man who would become a legend. He's a man lionized by youth and revolutionaries around the world. The face on millions of t-shirts. But the real Che Guevara was not a two-dimensional image, but a complex man with an unwavering goal. Che described being a guerrilla as the highest form of humankind, someone who was prepared to sacrifice himself for an ideal, in his case, and it was for the cause of Marxism-Leninism, the solution to mankind's ills, and the only way to turn around the world order from one dominated by Yankee capitalism. In author John Lee Anderson's best-selling biography, Che Guevara, A Revolutionary Life, he explores the man behind the myth. First and foremost, I wanted to know what had led this well-born son of an affluent old Argentine family, a son of the middle class, with everything going for him, to leave that comfortable existence and become the most implacable, well-known revolutionary of his day. May 14, 1928. Che Guevara is born Ernesto Guevara de la Serna in the city of Rosario, Argentina. Ernesto Guevara Lynch was Che's father. Celia was from an illustrious Spanish family. They were considered to be of the upper class. Carlos Figueroa is a childhood friend of Ernesto's. Ernesto didn't discriminate. He would hang out with all the kids, whether they were children of privilege or the children of servants. The eldest of four children, Ernesto is afflicted with chronic asthma, a condition that haunts him throughout his life. The family moves to the hill town of Alta Gracia, hoping the drier climate will help their sick son. In Alta Gracia, Ernesto meets Calica Ferrer. The boys and girls would gather around to dance, but Ernesto was a really bad dancer. He had a bad ear. We'd be playing one style of music and he'd be dancing to another. The adolescent Ernesto was known for being hypersexual. His first experience was with the family maid. He would try to seduce any woman of any shape, age, or appearance. One of Ernesto's more unusual traits is his lack of hygiene, which earns him the nickname Chancho, meaning pig in Spanish. He had a shirt called the Weekly Shirt because he would only change it once a week. We called him Chancho, and it stuck with him ever since. But he didn't mind. He kind of liked it. Yet for all Ernesto's wild antics, he possesses a very introspective side. He was always searching um, for a kind of the meaning for life. He was more advanced than his peers. He read serious authors. Nehru and Gandhi and Steinbeck and Faulkner and Mussolini. He was a voracious reader. Though he enrolls in medical school, Ernesto's true education comes from the trips he takes through undeveloped Latin America. Alberto Granado was an older student. He proposed that the two take off for a journey by motorbike the length of Latin America. It was a quest to look beyond the privileged confines that were his birthright. Putting his medical degree on hold, Ernesto and Alberto head out on an old Norton motorbike nicknamed La Ponderosa II 
on January 4, 1952. All we could see was the dust on the road ahead and ourselves on the bike, devouring kilometers in our flight northward. They traveled down to Patagonia and across to Chile, where La Poderosa finally gave out. Ditching the bike, they travel on foot and hitch rides on the back of trucks, heading for the interior of Chile. They traveled up to see the world's greatest open pit copper mine, Chuquicamata, which loomed large in the imaginations of Latin Americans in the time because it was US owned and run. It was this notion of the kind of monstrous capitalist enterprise uh, exploiting the local workers. American companies like Anaconda and Kencott monopolized Chile's mining industry. American companies went to Latin America for two reasons, cheap raw materials and cheap wages. To a young nationalist and a young idealist of the early 1950s, it would be very hard to look upon U.S. policies as practiced in Latin America kindly. He saw something he hadn't seen before. He saw the face of poverty. In America, Ernesto, being who he was, was terribly bothered by what he had seen. From Chile, Ernesto and Alberto head to Peru and then continue on to Venezuela. After seven months on the road, Alberto decides to stay in Venezuela, while Ernesto returns home to Buenos Aires to complete his last year at medical school with a new social conscience. All this wandering around, or America with a capital A, has changed me more than I thought. When he finished medical school, he said, See, you thought I couldn't do it, but I graduated. So pack your bags, because we're going to be leaving soon. Ernesto and Calica head for Bolivia. Along the way, they meet other young travelers. They were students. They had invited us to see Guatemala. Ernesto is intrigued by the students' political fervor and the situation in Guatemala, where President Jacobo Arbenz is attempting to bring about a social revolution through land reform. Arbenz was intent on nationalizing the unused land of the major uh, U.S. banana uh, and fruit companies, particularly United Fruit. Uh, of course, United Fruit was a company that had very close ties to the Eisenhower uh, administration. The Secretary of State John Foster Dulles had been on the board of United Fruit. John Foster Dulles was the brother of Alan Dulles, the director of the CIA. United Fruit paid a, a very skilled public relations specialist to kind of whip up a frenzy about the uh, threat of communism in this small, impoverished country of Guatemala. December 24, 1953. It is amid this charged atmosphere that Ernesto first arrives in Guatemala. Soon he is introduced to a Peruvian woman named Hilda Gadea. Hilda immediately became besotted with him. She had even went to the point where she pawned some jewelry in order to keep him in his hostels. And eventually they began sleeping together. Hilda introduces Ernesto to followers of a 26-year-old Cuban lawyer named Fidel Castro. He had led an attack on the Moncada military barracks, the second largest military garrison in Cuba, in an audacious attempt to overthrow Cuba's president, General Fulgencio Batista. Many of the people that attacked the barracks, a lot of whom were students, former students, workers, organizers, a lot of them were killed, tortured, killed. Uh, the ones that survived, including Fidel Castro and his brother, were sentenced to prison. Castro was serving a 15-year sentence, but Ernesto was deeply impressed with his men. Unlike his Cuban friends, Ernesto was not committed to any cause or ideology, but the ouster of Guatemala's president, Arbenz, changes his view. The first CIA-sponsored coup in Latin America took place in, in Guatemala in 1954. And essentially the army got scared and told Arbenz that he had to resign, and, and, and he did. Castillo Armas is placed in power on June 27, 1954. He's seen by many as an American puppet. He begins arresting suspected communists and anyone connected to the old regime. 
Threatened with jail and possibly execution, Ernesto takes refuge at the Argentine embassy. He came away convinced that the United States was, as he famously later called it, the enemy of humanity. Jacobo Arbenz Guzman succumbed before the cold, premeditated aggression of the USA, hidden behind a smokescreen of continental propaganda. Ernesto now considers himself a Marxist. Communism seemed to offer a way forward and a ready-made ideology for the kind of new society that could rise from the ashes of the old. Ernesto Guevara, he left Guatemala a very radicalized individual, looking now for a revolution he could fight in. September 1954. Like many other leftists, Ernesto heads for Mexico City, where former President Cardenas had successfully nationalized its oil fields in the 1930s. Mexico had a historic standing as one of the countries on the flank of the United States who had stood up to Yankee imperialism at the turn of the century. Ernesto reconnects with his Cuban friends and is introduced to Raul Castro. After serving 22 months in prison for his role in the Moncada siege, he has come to Mexico City to try and rebuild his older brother Fidel's organization. Then they liked one another. He was a Marxist, as opposed to a Fidel, who was still in prison. Succumbing to international pressure, Batista releases Fidel Castro after having only served a two-year sentence. He also heads for Mexico City. This was a person who had tried to overthrow a dictatorship, dictatorship by the force of arms, and what a lot of people consider almost like a, a brazen, crazy attack on the Moncada barracks. Now he was exiled from his homeland, and guess what? He was organizing to try and go back and do the same thing. Where Ernesto is reserved, serious, a communist, Fidel Castro was none of these things. He'd gotten into the rough and ready politics of his day and had positioned himself as a patriot and nationalist. He was not yet a Marxist-Leninist. August 1955. Eager to meet the man who had stirred such passion in his followers, Ernesto asks Raul to arrange a meeting. The meeting lasts all night. Political occurrences having met Fidel Castro, a Cuban revolutionary, a young man, intelligent, very sure of himself, and of extraordinary audacity. I think there is a mutual sympathy between us. They share many of the same ambitions and the same nemesis, the United States. Ernesto is invited to join the July 26th movement, named after the date of the Moncada siege. The only non-Cuban in the group, he signs on as troop doctor and is given the nickname Che. Argentines say Che when they talk to one another. It's an old term meaning, hey, you. And so they began calling him Che. Hilda had been left behind in Guatemala. She now joins Che. Hilda announced that she was pregnant, which came as a bit of a blow. But curiously, he decided to do the right thing, and he married her. Soon after the birth of his daughter, Hildita, Che pours all his energy into the movement and the big push for Cuba. Almost immediately, he was off for long periods of time in a ranch outside Mexico City, where they trained militarily. He turned out to be one of the best shots in the group. But word soon gets out, and Che, along with Fidel Castro and most of the July 26 movement members in the city, are arrested and detained. They're in jail for a month. Upon their release, the movement goes underground. Fidel Castro continues with his plans of overthrowing Batista and purchases a beat-up old boat for $15,000, appropriately named the Grandma to take his small army of 82 from Mexico to Cuba. They anticipate a five-day journey. Che writes a letter to his mother informing her of his actions. Hilda is to mail it if he should die in battle. In essence, saying his last goodbyes to Hilda and his young daughter that if he survived, he would see them again. Uh, but you know, the revolution called 2 a.m. on the morning of November 25, 1955. 
82 men board the Grandma. With our lights extinguished, we left the port of Tuxpan amid an infernal mess of men and all sorts of material. Fidel's words began to take on reality. In 1956, we shall be free or we shall be martyrs. His cause was revolution in Latin America. The next objective was Cuba, to liberate Cuba. And he had ceased to call himself Ernesto Guevara. He had become Che. Twenty-seven-year-old Che Guevara has joined Fidel Castro and 80 others on an armed expedition to overthrow Cuban President Fulgencio Batista. On November 25, 1955, the small army boards an old boat named the Grandma and heads for Havana. Ninety miles off the Florida coast, the island of Cuba is enjoying benefits from its booming tourist industry. Havana was the whorehouse of the Caribbean. It was uh, a place where Americans went on dirty weekends. There were live sex shows, showgirls. It was full of prostitutes, drugs. It was a, uh, a carnival atmosphere to which a lot of American tourists flocked. And there were some very positive aspects of it, but there was another Cuba, and the other Cuba was a Cuba that was basically run militarily by dictatorship. Although the Eisenhower administration supports Batista, most Cubans consider him a ruthless dictator. Fulgencio Batista was as much of a thug as, as ever governed uh, a Latin American country. Uh, he was somebody who was considered beholden to U.S economic interest to the interests of the U.S. Mafia in Cuba. The seven-day passage aboard the Grandma has been turbulent. The entire boat took on an aspect both ridiculous and tragic. Men with anguished faces, holding their stomachs, some with their heads and pockets, others lying in the strangest positions, immobile, their clothing soiled with vomit, it was an unmitigated disaster. They lost their bearings. Uh, they lost a man overboard, later saved him. Uh, when they eventually reached the coast of Cuba, they landed in the wrong place. They arrive in Cuba two days late and in broad daylight. As the old boat approaches Las Coloradas Beach, they hit a sandbar. Foundered and had to stumble ashore into a marsh before the troops have a chance to regroup, Batista's Air Force attacks and sends Che and the rest of Fidel Castro's men fleeing. They're able to evade enemy forces for the next three days. But on December 5th, their luck runs out. In a matter of seconds, a hurricane of bullets. It's only added to the Dantesque and grotesque scenes around us. A stout guerrillero trying to hide behind a single stalk of sugar cane. And another without really knowing why, crying out for silence in the midst of the tremendous uproar. More than two-thirds were massacred immediately. Che was wounded in the neck. He had to make a split-second choice between taking with him his rifle and ammunition or the first aid kit. He left the first aid kit and took the ammunition. When Che finally reunites with Fidel Castro and the others, he's shocked to see how small the group is. Only 17 of the original 82 men on board the Grandma, amongst them Che and the Castro brothers, Fidel and Raul, were amongst the survivors. The invasion was such a disaster that news reports initially sent out the news that Fidel and Che had died. Fidel Castro, Che, and the others regroup and move towards the Sierra Maestra mountain range. The Sierra Maestra was the mountain range nearest the coast where they landed and where Fidel planned to base his guerrilla movement. The Sierra Maestra is home to renegades, smugglers, and a hardy peasant population. 
en aquellos momentos... Neither were I or the other farmers in the area aware that there was a revolutionary movement taking place. It took us by surprise. I knew nothing about politics. 16-year-old Dariel Ramirez, nicknamed Benigno, works on his father's farm in the Sierra Maestra. They arrived at my home to ask for food, and we gave them some. But I didn't help them because I sympathized with them. I helped them out of fear of repression. The strangers in the mountains are viewed with suspicion. Who are these bearded, smelly strangers with guns making a noisome intrusion into their lives? Fidel Castro tries to convince the peasants to side with him and his men. He decided to impress upon the peasants that he would bring about an agrarian reform. And he did that by basically stealing a bunch of cows from landowners and liberating them and handing them over to the area's peasants. That was a fairly popular move. Castro decides it's time to make the rebel presence felt and plans for an attack on an army outpost in the area. Che is heading for his first battle. On January 22, 1957, the rebels stage an ambush on an army patrol. As the first shots ring out, Che is face to face with the enemy. He shot him when he saw him drop. And he seemed to be gauging his own reactions to see how he felt about it. And he felt fine. He felt fine. The small group is now faced with having to execute one of their own. A traitor, a man called Eutimio Guerra, one of their first collaborators, was discovered to be a spy. Fidel sentenced this man to death. No one ever said who had executed Eutimio Guerra, but in Che's personal diary, it emerged that he had, and he described it in vivid detail, taking the man's possessions from him, exchanging words from him, and then Che stepping up to his side. There was a thunderstorm breaking just then and placing a revolver at his temple and blowing his brains out, the 25 caliber revolver. Che inspected the entry and exit wound, very much the doctor writing down that he had slept fine with what he had done. From that moment on, Che changed. War is harsh, and at a time when the enemy was intensifying its aggressiveness, one could not tolerate even the suspicion of treason. I don't know the final tally of uh, execution victims of Che Guevara, but it was certainly dozens. February 17, 1957. Hiding out in the Cuban jungle, a small band of revolutionaries led by Fidel Castro contends with the constant threat of army ambushes and traitors in their midst. But thanks in part to Che Guevara's ruthlessness, the group is slowly gaining in strength and fierce reputation. Fidel Castro's troops and their exploits soon catch the attention of the world press. A newspaper editor named Herbert Matthews from uh, the New York Times, who had got smuggled up to meet him. Castro gave the impression to Herbert Matthews that he had like 100 to 150 men. In fact, the mighty rebel army is made up of only 20 men. When the article is published a month later, it confirms that Fidel and Che have survived the initial attack by Batista's forces and that their movement is thriving in the Sierra Maestra. In response, Batista deploys 1,500 more soldiers to hunt down the rebels. On March 25th, Batista's army arrived at my house. They surrounded my home and opened fire because I had been reported as a collaborator with the rebel army. They killed my wife. That's why I joined the rebel army. Meanwhile, July 26th, urban members sign up reinforcements. One of the new city recruits is Chuck Ryan, 
a 19-year-old American attending high school at Guantanamo Bay, where his father works as a U.S. Marine Corps medic. We had a large society with the Cubans. We were all friends, and we went to their weddings and their baptisms and things like that. Well, I offered to help them to get gun supplies to fight against the dictatorship. Soon, Chuck and two other teenagers from Guantanamo are invited to join the rebels. So we talked about it and settled a few things and left letters for our parents. The American teens, along with 50 other new recruits, are taken into the Sierra Maestra. One of the first people they meet is Che. I think that that the real reason they said Che was those men that we came with, many of them were, were very ill because it took us 30 hours of walking to get up those hills with those packs. There are other American volunteers. One of them is 18-year-old Don Saldini. Whole rebel army, including Fidel, Che, Raul, and my group was estimated to consist of 300 men. Life within the rebel camp is not easy. I had no soles on my boots. We ate when we could. Sometimes we didn't have water. We marched for oh, a couple of hundred miles over the mountains. I was uh, plagued with dysentery and what have you. In the jungles of Cuba, the rebels are vulnerable to all types of health problems, which Che treats. We would get large infected mosquito bites on our legs and things. And he would come over and take the scabs off and put sulfur powder on there. Men were pretty scared of being treated by him. They called him uh, Dr. Sacamuelas, tooth puller. He was pretty rough. He was not known for his delicacy. Along with his doctor's duties, Che proves himself repeatedly on the battlefield. It's been said, in more hands-on fashion than Fidel. Che was a true model in front of us. While Fidel looked for a place of refuge to hide himself, Che was bare-chested. He always rushed to the front lines during battles. His willingness to confront death, to take life, to risk his own life, came together to form a charisma that was highly unusual and which gave him an almost legendary reputation. And he emerged as a man which others feared and also respected and admired. Seeing how well Che conducts himself in battle, Fidel promotes him to commandant on July 12, 1957, and gives him his first military command of 75 men, known as Column Number 4. The vanity which we all have in us made me the proudest man in the world that day. There were those who fell under his leadership and charisma, and particularly very young boys, you have to call them, 15, 16 year olds. Some of them were runaways who became his disciples, and they became known as Los Cachorros del Che, Che's cubs. He was everything to them, an older brother, a father, a guerrilla leader, an instructor, very much the ideologue. He gave them literacy lessons. He wanted them to read and write. Others do their best not to attract his attention. He could punish someone for three to six days without food for something minor. This character and furious discipline of his makes me believe it was fear that we had of him. We feared that he would impose upon us a punishment. By October, Che has a new base in La Mesa. With this freedom, Che starts to organize the area, starting an armory bakery, butcher shop, and even a newspaper called El Cubano Libre. By February 1958, they are broadcasting messages on their own radio station, Radio Rebelde. Not all the guerrillas know they are fighting a communist revolution. Fidel nunca nació. If Fidel had told us that it was a communist movement, all of the recruits would have abandoned him, for sure. There was a lot of concern about Castro's power and, and uh, rhetoric uh, and who he was. He was a bit of a mystery at that time. 
The CIA and the U.S. military continue to give Batista weapons. The Sierra Maestra swarms with Batista's troops, yet the rebels maintain the upper hand, having gained enormous support from the local population. Batista's army was on the ropes, and it was to Che that Fidel looked to take the war to the north. After 18 months in the Sierras, it's time to expand the war to the other parts of Cuba. Che Guevara and his column marched 370 miles to Las Vias province, strategically positioned near Santa Clara, Cuba's fourth largest city, just four hours from Havana. In late 1958, that he met Aleda March. She was a supporter of the July 26 movement. Aleda had smuggled weapons and messages from the cities to Che's camp. But on one such mission, her cover is blown. She ended up staying in the mountains and joining Che. And in the course of the coming weeks, as they left the Escambray to do battle against Batista's army in the towns around Santa Clara, they became lovers. Meanwhile, the guerrilla war intensifies. Fidel Castro and his rebel army, now of about 800 men, begin to move through Orient province, while Che attacks army garrisons using psychological guerrilla tactics to scare away the enemy. On Monday, at one in the morning, one rebel went and took one shot into the garrison and got, of course, this massive firepower response. Then went home or went to sleep or went to do something else. The next night, a couple of rebels, one at 11 o'clock and one at 4 in the morning, did the same thing, one shot. By the third night, that garrison was always up and not sleeping. They basically made these people just want to leave. And I'm sure after about two weeks, that garrison just abandoned camp and went into, into town. You're in a situation where you're thinking you're, you're fighting a superior enemy. That morale-wise, that cannot be very good. I think that definitely affected the Batista army. On December 27, 1958, Fidel Castro orders Che to assault Santa Clara, Batista's last holdout, with 340 fighters against an enemy force 10 times the size. The troops were drilled. They knew what they were doing. They knew they had a good commander. They had Che was top of the line. 